So I was looking through the media this week and, and I realized that things are not what we want them to be. In fact, in Virginia, the representative uh, said that they called the white supremacist groups. We, they told them, we don't want you to be here who have a plan tomorrow to have a rally for gun support. And I was looking and I said, I believe in the Second Amendment. Amen. Amen. I myself, your pastor, is a marksman. <laughs> Watch out. And so, so, so I don't have any problem with that. But it's because you own the right, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, there's no need to have hatred for one another. And that's what Dr. King talked about. And so I want us to go to the Lord in prayer because we're going to talk about this dream and how we need to seize the moment. This is the time. Somebody say, this is the time to seize the moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you right now for all that has been said and all that has been done. In this service, God, we thank you right now that you are having your way in our midst. Lord, that you are blessing us right now. Lord, that your will would be done and your kingdom would come. Lord, speak to our hearts right now that we may be able to seize the moment, that we may be able to move forth through our difficulty as we discover our destinies. Lord, help us to know our path, our, our focus. And Lord, as we honor Dr. King this weekend, let America be stronger. Let America love one another and come together as one in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we speak against hate. We speak against all of those things that are not of you, God. And we give you the glory today in the name of Jesus. And if there's one person who says, I don't know Jesus, in the pardoning of my sins, we pray that they say, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Let's give the Lord a big shout of praise. Come on, you can do better than that. It is the Lord who we come to glorify. It is Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, we magnify you and we glorify you. We give you the praise today for you are worthy. The Lord is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody give him a praise today. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord if you open your Bibles to Genesis, the 39th chapter. Thank you, choir. Thank you, band. Thank you, ushers. Thank you for all coming out today. I want to acknowledge our ministers in the house today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing, uh, Minister Harris, on your vision. As you know, we as a church cannot endorse any political position, but we thank the Lord for having a vision. You know, I was thinking about this when Dr. King, you know, one of my heroes, and that's, that's why I was wanting that video to work so badly. I put together some years ago, and I think you would have enjoyed it in watching just a quick uh, 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 depiction of his life. But I remember when he really emphasized that it is an America, a united America is what we need. Uh, but today, I, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by what I see in America. I don't know about you. I'm troubled by the division that still tries to rise up. And, and, and we as Americans need to come together. Amen, somebody. And that's what I love about it because cause, cause right here in Portland, Oregon, uh, I'm ready to shock this city. 
you may be asking me, well, what are you talking about? Because Dr. King said, I have a dream. He says it is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. See, see, he had a dream that we could become one and that we can function together despite the differences of skin tonation and melanin, some melanin, a lot of melanin, which causes one to be browner or not brown. But we all have color. That's why I laugh at people when they say people of color. I'm like, wait a minute, there's some transparent people around here. Y'all, y'all don't have color? Now, now, look, this is on the news, this is on the media, because we can't get the vision. See, the vision is, look, that we can come together. If you just look around this church right here, because Highland Christian Center is making a statement that we don't care what your ethnicity is. All we care about is that you love Jesus Christ. All we care about is that you're covered by the blood of Jesus. And see, I know that's what Dr. King's dream was. And people fought him on it. They didn't want integration. They wanted separation. But I'm here to tell you that God wants integration. See, see, so while you have the, the quote-unquote, y'all know I don't like using color terminology, but that's what it says in the media, the white supremacists. Do you even put those words together? makes no sense. And so, so this group says we hate people who have melanin in their DNA, right? But listen to this. We got to deal with even larger problems. That's a big problem in America. But I submit to the church, we got larger problems in America. For instance, 7,000 young men of African descent will kill themselves in this year alone. We don't talk about that. Because we lose the self-worth and the dignity. So the problem goes deeper than just the old past. People who are segregationists and discriminatory. But God is calling for the church to open its eyes. And we got to stand together as a community and become the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We got to speak out against all kinds of violence. And hate crimes are wrong, but self-killing is wrong. Can you say amen, somebody? 5,000 people of European descent will kill themselves this year. 3,000 people of Hispanic descent will kill themselves this year. See, this is the problem that we have to face. We are all God's children, and we need to be concerned about everybody. That's the America I'm talking about. We got the impeachment trial happening right now. We got the U.S. still dealing with North Korea, Kim Jong-un, who said he's about to build his fantastic missiles. We have Iran making threats again. Oh, yes, you're reading about it. We have earthquakes in diverse places. Lives being lost from disease and viruses that are spreading. I hope I'm encouraging you today. <laughs> Because my hope is not built on all of that. My hope is built in Jesus Christ. It's on the solid rock that I can stand today. And that's what I want to talk to you about, that God is still in control no matter what's going on in our lives. Yeah. Hallelujah, somebody. You know, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Dr. King said this on the eve of Dr. King's celebration, and I used to lead these marches. And I was thinking, why doesn't Portland have a march? Why are we, do we have a march where we just get out there? Well, you know, we can do it from Highland. We can make up our minds that we're going to march in the streets. We're going to march for unity. We're going to come out. We're going to combat drug addiction and sex addiction. We're going to combat all of the hatred and the violence and the murder and discriminatory practices. Why don't we march? Put that on my agenda next year, Eric. Put that on my agenda. Why don't we march? Amen, somebody. See, so, so we, Madeline and I and the kids, we marched every year. We marched every year. And in fact, in San Antonio, it is one of the biggest marches that will take place around the world. 
even in beautiful tropical Hawaii, I marched last year. See, see, you got to get up out your seat and take action. So this is what Dr. King says. He says, like an unchecked cancer, he says, hate corrodes the personality and eats away its vitality or vital unity. Listen to this. He says, hate destroys a man's sense of values in his objectivity. It causes him to describe the beautiful as ugly and the ugly as beautiful and to confuse the true, the truth with false and false with the true. And so, so in spite of all that is going on, Dr. King's words, even 60, 70 years later, still ring true today. Yes, hate is a cancer. It controls, and, it, and this is what happened in our story if you open your Bible and, and, and to Genesis 39 because what Joseph was dealing with was hate from his brothers. He had a dream, and his brothers did not like his dream. Dr. King had a dream, and no one liked his dream. But, you know, we caught on to the dream, and you can try to kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. And so that's why Dr. King did what he did. And I, I submit to you, yes, love is, has waxed cold in America. And, and that's why it's so important for you and I to love one another. Amen, somebody. And, and it is important for us to love in the church. Because a lot of us, if we can't love one another in the church, how do we want the world to look to the church as a light on the hill. How do we want the world to look to the church for a refuge when we can't get along with one another? When the church is divided on Sunday mornings, still to this day, it is the most segregated hour in America, but not at Highland Christian Center. We, we're not divided because we recognize the power of the anointing. We recognize that it is God who called us all together. And I don't know why God has put me here exactly. I'm figuring it out as you are figuring out. We don't know why you're here either. But I'm figuring it out. And I'm walking with the Lord. And I'm trusting in God. And that he's going to do something that's going to blow our minds. Everywhere I've been, I've preached the same message of unity. That we must Continue together with God and that that the dream lives on in you and I and we can't close our eyes to it. We can't turn a blind eye to what's going on in America. We got to stand up together and we make a difference. And so today, as we continue in this series on discovering our destiny. I pray that God will reveal to us where we fit in in the kingdom of God and where do we fit in in our personal lives. Because a destiny means a place to where I am going. A destiny, a location. And, and we, we started off by acknowledging that there are many who don't know their purpose in life. What on earth am I here for? What, what I want to share with you is the, the, the dealings, the ongoing dealings with Joseph in his life, his discovery of what God would have him to do and what God would have him to become. And so this story is a historical fact. And when you look at Joseph's life, it mirrors Dr. King's life. It mirrors Christ's life. It mirrors our lives in so many manners. And so, as you know, I've been sharing some of Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven uh, uh, Life uh, tips that he gives. And number one, this week I want to share with you, he says that we are created to become like Christ. You and I are created to become like Christ. No matter what you're searching for in life, if you don't have Christ in the center of your life, then we are missing what we are created to do. Number two, the Holy Spirit will produce a godly character. If we trust in the Lord, if we trust in God, it is the Holy Spirit who produces a godly character. 
And then number three, we are transformed by the truth and troubles. When we hear the truth, it can transform us. Like today, I pray that I'm preaching the true word of God. And it will transform us as we go through our troubles and our trials. They're not meant to destroy us, but they're meant to build us up. Number four, you were uniquely designed by God. Every one of us has a purpose and a design and an equipment. We have our gifts. We, we have uh, the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. We have unique abilities. Some of us have the same gifts, but even when we have the same gifts, God will use us differently in, in ministry. Amen, somebody. So look at Genesis 39, and Brother John did a great job, Minister Lampkin. Look at 23, which he read earlier. Now Jacob is distraught still over the, con the condition of Joseph, who he believes is dead. He is told by his other sons that Joseph was eaten, remember, and he was killed, and they got jealous, and so they took the cloak of many colors, and they put some blood on it, took it back to the father, ripped it up, and said, he is dead. And I said, that's an evil, uh, evil thing to do to a father. Then he was thrown into the pit, and as he was thrown into the pit, he cried out, but nobody answered. And then his brothers, Reuben is the one who saved him. And then Jacob came along. And then Jacob even interceded for him and said, let's sell him to the Islamites. They sold him to the Islamites. And then he there, he was with a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar had this vast uh, land and house and slaves. And Joseph became one of his slaves. But yet we found last week that God is blessing Joseph in Potiphar's house because he keeps the faith. Everyone say, keep the faith. Keep the faith. And here is where we want to deal with. He's in the house, and we know the enemy is trying to persuade us to turn to the left or right when trials and tribulation comes our way. But God wants us to keep the faith. He wants us to keep believing no matter how difficult it gets. No matter who stands with you or who leads you, keep the faith. In 1 Peter 5 and 9, the Bible says, Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And I always refer back to the civil rights because I know that was a lot of suffering. Some of you were able to walk in those marches. I've heard that. Somebody told me some of you in this room were able to march. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. You know, when I was the president of the black history, quote, unquote, you know, I don't like colors, but the black history committee uh, back in the day in the 80s, I remember trying to bring us all together. And in the 80s, God gave me a vision. And he says, why do you have, as the president, Mr. Nayland, Sergeant Nayland, why do you have this committee? And I said, Lord, this committee is meant to bring back a remembrance of the atrocities and the things that were done to uh, people who had melanin in their skin. And, and I said, that's why I'm doing it, Lord. That's why I'm speaking every year and doing the I Have a Dream speech all around the world. That's why I'm speaking and involved. But then he says, but what else? What else? And, and I said, well, we, 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 the, the vision, Lord, is to come together in spite of the trials and the tribulations. The vision is to, to come together. And so he gave me this vision. And so as this young 20-something-year-old, I, I went talk to the, to the Asian Pacific group. I went talk to the Native American group. I went talk to the women's group. I went talk, I talked to all of the group. And then I said, oh, we don't have a European heritage group. I said, they said, oh, that's the 4th of July. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I said, but no, no, no. It's 4th of July. It's for everybody. They said, no, no, no. That's not our day. I said, yes, it is. And then I, so, so then what we did is we got together. We pulled everyone together. And I had a meeting with the commanders of the base. And I said, what would this committee look like if everybody came together? Watch this. Are you bracing for yourself? 
We're not going to be called the, the Women History Month anymore. We're not going to be called the Asian Pacific Heritage. We're not going to be called the Hispanic Heritage, the African American or the Black History Month. We're going to be called the American, the American, the American History. Yes, I did this. this is, I'm not making this up. And everybody was on one accord. Because I said, what would happen if all Americans got together to celebrate black history? <laughs> I know it's hard for you to get right now. What would happen if all Americans got together to celebrate Hispanic history? What would happen if all Americans came together on a culminating day and say we call it the 4th of July, Independence for All of America? I know, I know. See, see, that's, that's the vision God gave me so many years ago. And so this is the vision I stand with you today. Today I stand before you to tell you we can come together as Americans. We can come together because some may be doubting what I'm saying right now. I understand that. But just like Joseph understood, he understood if he trusted in the Lord that all things are possible. So here, I want to give you three quick tips this morning. Number one, write this down, that God can do the impossible. You see, what I just shared with you, the vision, you might say, that's impossible. It's not impossible because nothing is impossible with God. To them who believe, with man, the Bible says, it may be impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. Joseph, uh, master, took him, verse uh, 39 and 20, and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confirmed, confined. Why? Because what we're going to see as our story unfolds, Joseph is being blessed. He's doing all of the things that he needs to do while he's a slave. He's blooming where he's planted. He's serving. He kept believing. And he knew that God had told him about the dream. He never gave up on a dream. No matter how tough it is, can I encourage the church to never give up on the dream? Whatever it is God told you to do, keep doing it. Don't give up on your business idea. Don't give up on your schooling idea. Don't give up on that relationship. Whatever it is, keep believing. Someone help me and say, keep believing. believing. Joseph said, listen, Lord, I'm, I'm doing my best. But then the Bible says... While he was doing his best, Potiphar's wife recognized that Joseph was a well-built and handsome man. Okay, you can look at the men next to you and you can say, you're well-built and handsome. Only if they're your husband or boyfriend. <laughs> Don't do it to your, the other person's husband. <laughs> Joseph, you're well-built. <laughs> so Potiphar's wife, they never name her, she starts uh, flirting. She starts to flirt with Joseph. And she tells Joseph, I want you to come to bed with me. I want you to lie down with me. But Joseph uh, refuses to lie down with her. He, she says, look, she says, you have everything. My husband has given you the power over the guards. You have the power in the house and outside of the house. You have all the power, and now I'm telling you, you can have me too. Uh-uh, the devil is a liar. The Bible says, submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Devil, get behind me. <laughs> Some of us got to learn how to submit ourselves unto God. Because let me tell you what, if you tell the devil to get behind you, but you haven't submitted yourself unto God, you got trouble. Oh, I know that went over your head right there. You can't resist the devil until you submit yourself to God. <laughs> because the flesh will rise up in us all. And Joseph was faced with the temptation like many of us are faced. And, but he decided that I'm going to serve God. And so like a good man, Joseph knew how to get out of trouble. 
he ran. Mm. Some of us need to run from the situation. Some of us need to run out of that house you're living in. Am I stepping on some toes? That's my intention this morning. Because we got to live the way God told us to live. Mm. If we're going to find our destiny, watch this, we have to start living the way God wants us to live. Lord, I want you to bless me. I want you to show me what to do, but I'm going to do it my way and do any and everything. That's not what it is. That's not going to get you there. And so, so, so she, she, Joseph, she grabbed his, his cloak and Joseph ran away and, and she kept his cloak. So when she kept his cloak, she would scream and say it was rape. Mm, there's so many things happening like that just today. Oh, could it get any worse? When will this end? When will my trouble end? Have you ever been like Joseph? Are you like, Lord, look, my brothers betrayed me. Uh, they threw me. My father didn't even like when I told him the sun and the moon would bow down. They threw me in a pit in the darkness, and then I got out of the pit, and my cousins, the Islamites, took me into slavery. And then they sold me to Potiphar, another slave owner. He says, Lord, now the wife is coming on to me and now she's claiming that I raped her can it get any worse how long must I suffer uh, Maud Royden says when you have nothing left but God then you become aware that God is enough when you have nothing left but God, uh, then you can become aware that God is enough. But I made up my mind that I know God is more than enough. Oh, he is my all in all. He is my bridge over troubled water. He will walk with me through the fire. He will walk with me through the difficulty. When my relationship is on the brink, God will walk with me. Can I get a witness out there? Mm -hmm. Because of the accusations, Joseph was thrown into the prison. But how many know that God will use the prison situation to give you the true destiny you need to reach? And some of us have been in a prison literally, and some of us have been in a prison figuratively. But whatever it is, I say God can use the prison to get us on the right track. And he will meet every need, and he will comfort us no matter what you're going through. And this is how Joseph's destiny and his dreams began to come to fruition. That which seemed the worst in your life, God could be using that very moment to change it and turn it around. The very thing you thought was meant to destroy you, God says, I'm going to use it for your good. I'm going to open doors for you that you cannot even ever imagine see Joseph had morality his his character stood out he wouldn't turn from God and turn to sin he made up his mind that even when I'm a falsely accused even when I'm going through the most difficult time I won't give up on God I keep telling Melvin when we were in, 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 in Europe, in uh, 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 England, this lady's sermon, I'll never forget it. All I remember is one line. I, I won't forget this line. I don't know what else she was saying. But she said, she was talking about Jeremiah. But she said, you can count on God, <laughs> but can he count on you? <laughs> I said, you can count on God. Look at somebody and say, you can count on God. But can he count on you? <laughs> can he count on you through the difficulty? Can he count on you through the storm? Can he count on you when things get tough and the wheels fall off and people leave you and forsake you and everybody talks about you and puts you down and tells you you won't make it and lie on you, scandalize your name? But can you stand with God? Through the storms and through the rain, I found out that, I told you I love the civil rights era. It seemed like I should have been there, right? But God has me where I need to be right now, I think. 
but I can tell you when Dr. King went to Salem, uh, Alabama, y'all been to Salem? Uh-uh, y'all ain't going nowhere. Y'all just watching it on TV. But I've been to Salem. I've walked across the bridge. But let me tell you, that, that bloody Sunday that we call, the third march when, when he was failed every time because there would, they were death threats and, 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 and the, the racists and the, the people who hated people just like Martin Luther King talked about wanted to kill him and ambush him. And, and they knew they couldn't get through and the security wasn't on their side. But then God gave him favor. Amen, somebody. Y'all, I, I, can I just preach this just a little bit? Because y'all not hearing what the Lord is saying right now. Because he's pumping it through my mind, but I just can't get it all out fast enough. Because don't you know, when they tried the first two times, they could not make it over the bridge. Oh, but when the European descent community saw the atrocities on Bloody Sunday, they said enough is enough. We're going down and joining our brothers and sisters. And when, when those of European descent joined those of Hispanic descent and African descent, oh, a change was about to happen in America. I know y'all don't get it right now. But so, so when they came together, one-third of the march from Selma to Montgomery was of European descent. I know you don't know your history well enough, but that's why you brought me here, to help us to get to the next level. It's when we come together that the change can happen. When America stood up and said, enough of this stuff. And they came together. You can call it all the colors if you want to use colors. I don't use colors. But they came together, people, God's people. The human race said enough of these atrocities. And they were able to march across the bridge. And when they went across the bridge, it took them a few days to get to Montgomery, Alabama. But see, what I want you to understand, because of that march came the Voting Rights Act. Man, you don't understand what I'm saying. Sometimes you got to get beat up. Sometimes you got to get bloody to understand and what God is going to do. And then he brings all the people together and he says, it's time, America, for a change. And I refuse to let America go back to the atrocities of the past. I refuse to just stand idly by and say, well, we're just divided and we can't come together. I say we can come together in the name of Jesus. We can come together by the blood of Jesus. We can overcome by the blood of Jesus. Wait a minute, we have overcome by the blood, oh God, and the word of their testimony. They have already overcome. Hallelujah, somebody. And so, I'm making up my mind this morning. I'm not looking for fame, money, power, and positions. All I want to do is do the will of God. I just want to serve him when it's going good and serve him when it's going bad. I just made up my mind. I want to be like Joseph. I like what Joseph did. He stayed in the fight. He didn't quit. He didn't give up when things got tough. And they threw him in the king's prison. And so now Joseph has moved from one prison to another prison. But did you not notice that it's the king's prison? Amen, somebody. That's significant. But, you know, I think about Hebrews 12 and 1. It says run with endurance. Everyone say run with endurance. You got to run this race. I told you I ran a few half marathons, and you got to run with endurance. But I found out my best time in my marathon was the first one I ran. Why? Because I trained. Oh, Mm -mm. I trained, I, I ran for months before the event took place. But when I thought I had it down, and the next year I did not train, but I got out there and I ran the marathon, half marathon anyhow, and I was in a lot of pain. 
And the next year, it got even worse. I said, oh, I can do it again. And I got on a half marathon, and I ran it again. This time, I had to stop in the middle of the half marathon. Can you believe that? Little measly 13 point whatever miles, I had to actually stop because I didn't train. And I want to move you to the spiritual. Many of us are not training. We're not training to run with endurance. We're not reading our word every day. We're not praying every day. We're not fasting unless the preacher tells you to fast. We're not living the way we need to live for the Lord. But I'm telling you, if we're going to find our destiny, we need to run with endurance. Somebody shout it with me. Run with endurance. Run this race that God put you in. Say, Lord, I'm looking for you to be the wind behind my sails. I'm looking for you to push me to the next level. You know, Malin, before she got sick with her lungs, I remember this. We used to run around the track. Malin said, come on, honey, run with me. I said, okay, I'm going to run with you. And I put my hand in her back. You remember that? She said, stop pushing me. You're pushing me too fast. Stop pushing me. But you know, that's what I can feel, the handprint of Jesus. Pushing me around the track of life. Saying, don't quit now. Don't give up now. You may be through some difficult moments right about now, but don't quit. Look at somebody and tell them don't quit. Don't give up. Don't, don't just doubt what God can do. He can turn it all around. In the name of Jesus, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. My God. I hear the Lord telling me to resist the flesh. Oh, yes, I hear the Lord pushing me. I'm saying it for somebody. Resist the flesh. Shout it with me. Resist the flesh. Resist the flesh. And learn, lean on the spirit of God. See, some may be feeling, Lord, all of these recent happenings in my life, I, I don't know if I can run this race. I, I don't know if I can keep going. But God says, keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. And it says, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Psalm 130, 1 and 2. You know, just the other day, a man was released from prison after 32 years. Did y'all see that in the media? 32 years, wrongly incarcerated. I submit to you, and you know this is a fact, that there are hundreds and perhaps thousands who, who have been wrongly incarcerated by an unjust system. That's why we got to run for office. That's why we got to stand up and fight. We got to change the system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he never gave up. Even in the darkest hours. Now he's going to get compensated, but they can't make up for the years that were gone. But I'm going to submit to you something else. Don't feel sorry for him, but just trust that the Lord is sovereign and he has a plan for him. Every time we go through difficulty, we must learn not to lean on in, in our, our natural uh, ability or our natural uh, uh, leanings is to say that, oh, woe is me. But we must learn to say, I got to accept what God is putting me through. I know that, that, that is not the most popular thing. But Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. So if you are called according to his purpose, if you love the Lord, it is all working together for good. You may not like it. It is not good for you. It doesn't feel good, but it's working together for good. Just keep pressing through. Look at somebody and tell them, just keep pressing through. All right, I know I got to move on. Number two, every encounter counts. Look at somebody and say it with me. Every encounter counts. Mm. Every person you've ever run into, every dealing that you've ever had, God is using it when we trust in him. When we stay faithful to God, everything counts. So Genesis 40, slip over to Genesis 40, 14 and 15. It says, uh, but when all goes well with you, Joseph asked him, he says, remember me and show me kindness. 
mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to be deserved to be put into this dungeon. So Joseph was put in the king's prison. Potiphar actually had the right to kill him. But God showed him favor. I know you may not think that's favor, but he allowed him to live. Because in order to reach our destiny, we need to live on earth. But we got a greater destiny, as Elder Ward reminded us a few weeks ago, in heaven. Amen, somebody. So the guard assigned uh, Pharaoh's chief butler uh, or cupbearer, the person who drinks the wine, the server of the wine. See, the Bible is talking about wine. And the chief cook to Joseph. <laughs> and so Joseph notices that they are sad one day. He noticed that their, their countenance is down. So Joseph goes up to him. He says, what's wrong? And, and they both had these weird dreams just the night before. And so the chief butler uh, uh, tells, I'm sorry, the chief cook first tells Joseph his dream, and Joseph gives it to him just as the Lord gave it to him. And Joseph said, oh, you're going to die. You're going to get impaled, and your head is going to get cut off. How would y'all like to come down for a prophecy right now? <laughs> Pastor, I had a dream. Well, the Lord told me to tell you, you're going to die tomorrow. <laughs> Joseph was tough. He just told them straight out, this is what the Lord said. You will be released, and then you will be killed. Wow, it's right. And then the, the cupbearer came, uh, the butler or cupbearer, the person who tastes the wine for the king before serving it to the king to make sure the king is not getting poisoned. And so he came, and then he said, uh, he told him a dream and so forth, and then he says, oh, you're going to be restored. And then that's when Joseph says in verse 14, he says, but when all goes well with you, cupbearer, Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Now, that see, this is the part you got to understand. Joseph understood that being in the prison was not pleasant. Even though he bloomed where he was planted, he prospered in everything he did. The Lord's favor was upon Joseph. Everything he touched went well, but he did not like being in the prison. You may not like where you're at right now, but all you have to do is keep believing and keep trusting God. Keep blooming where you're planted. Keep doing what God has called you to do. God knows where we're at. And after a two full years has passed, the, 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 the cook was released before that. And just as Joseph said two years earlier, he was released and he was killed. And then the cupbearer was released and he didn't remember Joseph at all. Don't you hate people like that? Don't hate, don't hate. Don't you not like people like that? <laughs> They said they're going to do this. They said they're going to do that. And then when I come into my glory, when I come into all this, I'm going to get this lined up. I'm going to do all this. And then you come to them. They say, what are you talking about? Like, like the old, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> what you talking about? <laughs> but, but listen, two years had passed. And sometimes people get so caught up in themselves that all they can remember is about themselves. And, and, and I don't know if the cupbearer did it on purpose, but he forgot all about Joseph. Even though Joseph had asked him, had been kind to him because he was put under Joseph's care. Joseph was his prison supervisor. But the Bible says when two, the Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret. When two full years had passed, listen to this, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, and out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat. They grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows who were ugly and gaunt came out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up even the sleek, 
fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. So he goes to his magicians. He goes to all of his soothsayers. No one could interpret and tell Pharaoh what that dream meant. But then all of a sudden, the cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today, I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry, put me in prison, and then we had a dream, and this young man interpreted our dream, and everything he said came true. Now, what's my point right here is that there will be times in your life when it looks the most bleakest. Oh, it looks like it's over. There's no way out of the situation. But somebody said, but God. There's a time when God will intervene because the Bible says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. So what I believe is that God is trying to tell the church is that I will never leave you or forsake you. I don't care how tough it gets, you got to know that God won't leave us or forsake us. He says, I'll be with you until the end, always with you. My word will be with you. And so Pharaoh, in his distress about his life because he was having dreams of thin cows and fat cows. He couldn't figure it out. Went to the astrologists and the soothsayers. They couldn't figure it out. But I want you to understand, God has a plan for everybody in this room. And he will put you in the right path at the right time in the right place. You just got to release your faith and say, Lord, I'm looking for my blessing. Lord, I'm looking for my destiny. Lord, show me the path. Show me the way. Come on, somebody say, show me the path. Show me the way. Every encounter, every person you ever touched, every person you ever dealt with, God has a plan. Dr. King said this, look, in his, some of his toughest times, this is what he said. He said, use me, God. He said, show me how to take who I am, who I want to be. Am I talking to anybody in here? Lord, take who I am and move it to what I want to be and what I can do and use it for a purpose greater than myself. Oh, I got a secret for you. When we start putting God's word first, when we put God's plans first, God will begin to move in a supernatural way that you and I cannot even imagine. Ear has not heard. Eye has not seen what the Lord has in store for us. Can I get a witness out there? Where God made a way out of no way. Where you started from nothing and then you move into a big business. And I was going to show you a video of Steve Harvey this week. I mean, Steve Harvey, he cracks us up, doesn't he? But he told how he was in his car for three years. His life was messed up. He could not find his way. He was ready to give up on his comedic uh, career. But then all of a sudden he got this one call. They said, can you be in Apollo tonight or this weekend? He says, I don't have the money, but yes, I'm going to be there. And then he got another call. Now, this is when he was at the end of his rope, living in his car for three years, did not have a way. He says, I'm done with everything. But, you know, Steve Harvey had faith through it all. I may not like everything Steve Harvey says, but he still believes in God. And so Steve tells the story. He tells the story. He says, so then when uh, I, I got another call, right after that call to go on to Apollo, his dream to be on TV and to be in the Apollo, he got the other call in Florida, said, we need you to do a gig tonight. He was so good in that gig. He made 150, and they say, we need you to stay one more night. Give me two tonight. And when he got the two, he was able to get on Northeastern Air. Doesn't exist today, but Northeastern Air. And he got to New York to the Apollo. And as Steve Harvey says, the rest is history. And today he makes more money <laughs> than most entertainers could ever dream about. Isn't that amazing? It's not just about the money, but it's how God will show you the way. How God will give you the dreams that you've been working on. 
how God will begin to open the doors and things that you thought were impossible, God says it's possible. Look at somebody and tell them it's possible. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which I ask, think, or imagine. Somebody shout. It's possible. Oh, it's possible. Mm. See, many times in our lives, we're similar to Steve Harvey. We're living in our cars, don't have any money, don't have any food, don't know how I'm going to survive. But then God just steps in in the nick of time. Oh, he's an on time God. Can I preach it just a little bit longer? I said God is an on time God. He's a God who will come in the midnight hour. Oh, I'm getting a little emotional because I know about it. Oh, I know about it. He's an on time God. When it looks bleak to you, God is able to open the doors that you thought were shut. God is able, look at somebody say, God is able to work your miracle. Hallelujah. Listen to what Joshua 23 and 14 says. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. How many know God cannot fail? If he told you it's going to happen, it will happen. Dr. King said, I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with it, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Oh, Lord, I need to get to the promised land. Mm, but you know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to end it right here. I need to fully rely on God. Look at somebody and give them a high five and tell them fully rely on God. And he'll make a way out of no way. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream no one can interpret. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret and Joseph replied. Somebody said, Joseph replied. He said, I cannot do it. Oh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I can't do it. You can't do it. But God can do it. Oh, yes. God can turn it around. Don't you give up. Keep dreaming. Keep believing it is possible. Hallelujah. Mm. I found out, church. Listen to this. Listen to this. I found out if I just understand and recognize that it's not me. Everything I'm doing today is not because of my ability. It's not because of my intellect. It's not because of how I look, but it's all because of the Lord on my side. He says, I can do all things. Somebody say all things. I can do all things. I can walk on water. I can tread over serpents. I can cast out demons. I can do all things. I can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In the name of Jesus, I can do it. Hallelujah. I found out that destiny comes for us when we say, Lord, I'm yours. Everything I have is yours. Everything I got, come on, praise team. Everything I got, it's yours. It's yours, Lord. Mm. The Bible says one man planted, another man watered, but God grants the increase. I believe Highland Christian Center, God is granting the increase. I believe God, listen, Pastor Hardy planted, Pastor Johnson planted, 
all the pastors before, Pastor Harder, planted. I come just to throw some water. I'm just throwing water. I said, I'm just throwing water. But God grants the increase. He grants the increase. I can't do it. But God.